Next up, we're going to have Lucas. Uh, Lucas is going to talk to us about how to actually ship an open hardware laptop, um, which might include some lessons that we weren't expecting. OK, hi, everyone. <clears throat> Let's see if this uh, um, works. Can you see my um, slide? Yeah. OK, perfect. <clears throat> Yeah, I'm uh, Lukas Hartmann, uh, the founder of MNT Research in Berlin. We designed and shipped an open hardware laptop with a tiny team and an initial budget of 150,000 euro around. Um, in this talk, I'm trying to extract some key lessons from the whole undertaking, some unusual practices um, that work for us and that might be helpful for your own projects. Um, the first lesson is make reproducible hardware. Um, we funded and launched the MIT reform through Crowd Supply. This is the campaign page today. Mm -hmm. And this is the MIT reform how it ships today, the trackball version, running Debian Linux. <clears throat> Why do we call it reproducible? Because all the PCBs are open hardware under CERN OHL, and we have free and open source firmware in the system controller and input devices. And we also publish the sources for the mechanical parts. Uh, that means you can not only study the device, but you uh, can also reproduce and improve it independently from us. Here's another version of the laptop with a multi-touch trackpad. As you can see, we made some unusual choices. The device is quite thick and has Ethernet and other full-size ports. If you flip it over, you can see that the underside is transparent inviting you to open it and explore what's inside. Here's the motherboard design in KiCad, which is our favorite open source electronics design tool. It probably gets mentioned a lot today. Um, you can see that the design is certified open hardware by Oshwa. The keyboard and input devices, uh, trackball and trackpad, um, are designed in KiCad as well. It's okay to simplify. Because our um, core team was only three people and the laptop is a very complex device, uh, we had to make compromises um, or be stuck forever in the so-called development hell and we would have run out of time and money. So we made some unusual choices and compromises to be able to actually ship this thing. For example, we really wanted a, a mechanical low-profile keyboard we decided to go with Kyle Chalk key switches, which were still up and coming in 2019. This is our keyboard layout. And if you look closely, you can see that it uses only two different keycap sizes, 1U and 1.5U keycaps. Here you can see that this means that the stagger in our keyboard is slightly different than in traditional keyboards. Um, the bottom picture shows that the traditional layout uh, that you're used to um, is slightly irregular. We went with the layout on the top because it would have been much more complicated and expensive to procure all different keycaps needed for a traditional layout and we would have required mechanical stabilizers of different sizes for um, all the bigger caps. The idea was uh, taken from the Commodore's SX64 keyboard. Here you can see on the Red line with those red lines um, that Commodore used the same trick to save parts in the 80s. Sometimes it's worth to look at old hardware for new ideas. Local small batch assembly. Because we were dealing with many unknown factors, we decided to do our own assembly in small batches in our uh, own studio. Um, so we decided to design everything in a way that we can hand assemble which was very valuable in the prototyping phase. Uh, for example, we uh, mostly avoided components um, below 06 or 03 size or BGAs wherever possible. These are uh, various versions of the motherboard that we uh, all hand assembled here. Uh, we have very basic stenciling equipment and an infrared oven to reflow the boards. <clears throat> this way we can quickly iterate on revisions without spending too much money and time on external services. And very importantly, we ensure that other people can also build or repair these parts without special equipment. Uh, <clears throat> so if, we, uh, if you combine 
the first three lessons, which were publish all the designs as open hardware and keep the components and assembly simple and produce in small batches, then you can make co-creation happen. I will show you an example. Norman Feske of Gnode Labs was one of the first people to receive the laptop and he immediately looked for a way to make our trackball move more smoothly. He found a very nice solution of drilling holes and inserting three steel ball bearings in the 3D printed cup. The ball then rests on these smooth bearings instead of the 3D printed cup. <clears throat> a few months later, reform owner Hayden Krupfel picked up the idea and posted his modified design files in our MT community. We reproduced Hayden's idea in our lab and found it superior to our own solution. So we adopted it in the middle of production. Um, there have been several other people in the community improving the laptop's firmware, Debian integration and more. Work together. The current version of uh, Reform ships with the NXP IMX8M system on chip that you can see here on this boundary devices module. Um, this chip is well documented, well supported by open source drivers like Etna Vif, um, project for the GPU and energy efficient, but too slow for some tasks like heavy JavaScript applications or video editing. We were expecting follow-up uh, processors from NXP by now, like IMX9, um, but they just did not appear, maybe because of the chip crisis. So we decided to design adapters for SOCs, um, system on chips uh, or system on modules that could uh, that would be considered competitors if you had a closed mindset. Um, here is RCM4, an adapter for the powerful Raspberry Pi Compute Module 4. And here it is installed in the reform motherboard during bring up. <clears throat> so why not join forces with other strong communities? In our case, Raspberry Pi and Pine. The most important thing is to get useful hardware and choice into the hands of people. Increase freedom through design for example, by modularity. As mentioned before, the laptop is designed so that the main system on chip and memory can be exchanged. We also have open hardware modules, one made in Altium and the other in KiCad, <clears throat> that people can use as templates. So two of these modules you see here are also open hardware. Here is the somewhat dense eight layer Kintec 7 FPGA module made in KiCad. This module can boot Linux on a soft RISC-V system uh, for example, powered by Litex. Um, another example is the keyboard. It is a self-contained USB input device. And you can also put it in an enclosure to use it independently from the laptop. FDM printable parts. Uh, FDM 3D printing is becoming more and more reliable and precise, uh, while also cheap and environmentally friendly. 3D printers are everywhere. So instead of having to ship replacement parts around the world, people can just print them locally. Here you can see uh, we switched to PLA <clears throat> in the production of the trackball housing. We even print uh, early case prototypes in PLA here. This is a very early validation prototype of MNT reform with fully 3D printed case. Um, standard components like batteries. Uh, we didn't want people to rely on us to source and replace batteries for their laptops. And we wanted to make sure that no one would put themselves in danger by experimenting with burning lithium ion cells. So uh, we picked the safer lithium iron phosphate chemistry, also called LIFEPO4, and decided to go with a standard form factor called 18650. This way, reform owners, but also we as the manufacturer, can pick from a wider range of suppliers that offer the standard format. That's very good in the case of shortages. St um, standard fasteners. And this is not very exciting, but instead of requiring special custom screws, um, we use standard M2 screws almost everywhere in the device. 
you can download a laptop. Um, <clears throat> one really nice result of all of these unconventional decisions that we made is that people can actually fork and recreate the laptop, the complete laptop locally. This is Jacqueline from Australia who built her own version of reform uh, and modified the motherboard and the keyboard in the process. Uh, for example, she added USB-C power delivery to the motherboard. This was possible because we published keycard sources and documentation for the motherboard. Here's her motherboard in the middle of being hand assembled. <clears throat> for the keyboard, uh, she made a big edit and turned it into a split ergonomic layout. And this is a shot of her laptop in its aluminum case, which she was able to get made from our design files totally independently. So um, <clears throat> this laptop was completely made um, with, uh, without our parts in Australia. Um, Creative Commons unbrand. One more little problem we solved is that uh, we didn't want people to use our brand logo on their clones and forks because we can only be legally responsible for products um, that we make ourselves. Um, uh, see also like customs requirements or W uh, E E E. Um, but we still want people to be able to signify which ecosystem the item is compatible with. So we created this unbrand that is similar but different to the original. Um, this is released as public domain under CC0. Here is how it looks on a, a PCB. And <clears throat> to wrap it up, um, yeah, let me repeat uh, the, the, the points. So, <clears throat> Our takeaways are make reproducible hardware, like publish the source files for everything, not only PDFs or schematics. Uh, simplify wherever possible. Um, make compromises, it's fine. Um, if, you make, if you work locally and make small batches, you can improve the product while, it's, while you're still building um, the batches. Um, so you don't have to get everything perfect on the first try. Uh, embrace co-creation, that means um, work with your community to get changes merged back into your product while you're making it. Um, work together with your competition, uh, maybe they're not the competition after all. Um, embrace modularity so that people can mix and match parts uh, and uh, reuse uh, parts of your product. Um, use standard components wherever possible. And if you want, create an unbrand that people can copy, but you are not legally responsible for. Um, and thanks, that's it. So I guess we have time for questions. Thank you. This was really great. People are so excited. They want everything. Um, I really <laughs> like your choices. Um, they're really enthusiastic about the unbrand. Um, so they have uh, some questions for you, including um, what do you mean really when you say small batch? Is it like one, 10, a hundred, a thousand? What do you think is small batch for different mm -hmm. people? Okay, so yeah, it, it um, depends on the product. Um, so if the product is, for example, one uh, large PCB or something, then a small batch um, is, or we usually work in batches of a hundred. Um, but for the laptop, um, we work in batches like 50. Um, and uh, the, whole, the whole batch size, of the first um, production batch size of Reform was 450 uh, units. But we split this in like sub-batches of 50, for example. And we um, incorporated changes during these um, micro-batches. Cool, cool, yeah. And I guess... Uh... There's so many things that can be batched also in your in your hardware. There are um, the little parts and then the whole laptop. So it's maybe batches all the way down. <laughs> some, <laughs> Absolutely. Some people have um, just questions about the details of being an unbrand. Is it like, uh, did you copyright the logo or like, did you put it in the public domain? How would other people go about making an unbrand? 
Okay, so um, the idea of the unbrand is that the, our main brand um, is copyrighted, like it's uh, trademarked, um, because we need to protect it uh, for legal uh, reasons. For example, uh, customs will check, uh, you know, what brands is on stuff, um, and uh, WEEE um, requires you to put your brand on stuff uh, because you're responsible, like for the safety of the thing, and so on and so on. And so we were like, okay, what if someone else uh, uh, makes a fork and, and resells, for example, the hardware? They need to change the logo, um, but it would be nice if they could still, if they wanted, refer back to um, the original thing and somehow um, si signal um, like uh, w where, what it is compatible to, where it can kind of belong, what ecosystem. So we have this kind of alternative brand that is public domain, um, and that doesn't mean that we, that is from us. That just means it's like kind of compatible on the spirit or um, maybe uses like original designs from us. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of people have um, questions about just like any uh, legal stories that come from having a public domain brand. And so maybe that's something that everybody will want to talk about in the Question Everything Discord channel. But we have other questions too. Um, some people are asking about like, if there were design decisions that you started with that you then regretted, maybe because um, you wanted things to be hand assemblable, but then you changed your mind for things. So can you talk about maybe how over the course of the project you changed things about the design and why? Um, <clears throat> Well, um, the, we didn't change a lot about the electronics um, in, uh, in the course of the project, but um, we made um, some manufacturing changes. So for example, uh, we work with SLA printing in-house um, on the trackball uh, because we thought we needed the precision of SLA for the trackball cup. Um, and uh, we printed our own trackball buttons and so on in-house, but this turned out to be very messy and toxic. and um so we outsourced the the buttons uh to another company who specialized in sla printing and uh we changed the process of printing the trackball um cup and the trackpad holder um to fdm so we are printing them still in house but now on uh like let's say safer and more environmentally friendly technology oh cool that's a cool way of changing yeah in-house control can mean lots of in-house goo, I guess. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. You, need to, you need to make sure that you can really handle that kind of stuff. <laughs> you mentioned that you didn't change the electronics much, just things about the manufacturing. Um, and mm -hmm. people have questions about just like keeping track of changes across manufacturing different batches. Do you have like batch versions? Do you do a different kind of version control for batching when mm -hmm. you do different manu manufacturing runs? Can you talk about that? Yeah, so at some point we introduced a so-called badge on the on all PCBs that always looks the same. Um, and it has like our SKU number and a revision number and a date code and so on. And um, and the license, the OHL um, license in it. So um, we update that and um, so then you can also see in which kind of keycat file does it correspond to? Cool. Um, in, in other yeah, in other products we also made electronic changes because there were like just bugs in there. But um, and we will also do it in the next reform batches. We will fix some bugs. Nice. That's <clears throat> always nice. <laughs> um, yeah. There's a there's a question also just specifically about electronics design. Um, I think it's maybe more about future feature requests for uh, KiCad, perhaps. Somebody wants to know, well, you know, you design modules in some proprietary software packages, but a lot of them also in KiCad. Is there anything that's missing from KiCad that you want to see? Is that why maybe you mm -hmm. use other packages like LTM? Okay, so um, here we only use KiCad, um, but uh, there's the um, LS1028A processor module um, designed by RBZ in Spain, and they only use Altium for everything. That was just a compromise um, of our collaboration. They agreed to publish it as open um, open source, uh, so you can download the Altium files, but um, if we would have done it ourselves, we would have done it in KiCad, but it's always like, you know, what people are trained in. So we'll have to ask them to see what features they want. Maybe the features that they yeah. want is just that they want to watch Chris Gamble's <laughs> getting to Blinky. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Thank you so much for your talk. Lots of people are excited about um, your laptop and have even more questions for you in Discord. Um, you can follow up with them. It would be awesome.